We are live on ABC's KMET 1490 AM.com, your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On a telephone line, I welcome to the program a legendary bass player of the American pop rock band Orleans. We welcome to the show Lance Hop and Lance Brian C. Honor to have you. Thanks for having me, Brian. Been looking forward to this. Absolutely. Um, Lance, this year marks 50 years of the legendary band Orleans. And if you recall, in the early 1970s, Rolling Stone magazine was quoted as saying Orleans was the best unrecorded band in America. And it seems like you guys proved them wrong because Orleans went on to become one of the most popular and respected national rock acts of all time. Uh, if you say so, sure. Yeah, no, uh, from what I gathered, I mean, uh, your dream early on in your career was to make a living playing music and doing it with your your late older brother, Larry. Uh, he made that dream come true to you, right? Yeah, all that happened. Um, we were the Hoppin family, very musical family. My parents were musicians. They met after World War II. My mom was a fantastic singer and really great piano player. My dad played trumpet. And so we always had music in the house. Uh, my older sister, Linda, then then Larry, then me, then Lane. Um, Larry, Lane, and I all wound up working together for, for decades in Orleans, particularly Larry and I. So, yeah, Larry was prodigious. He was uh, accelerated in school. He could play anything he could pick up. And um, nobody knew he had that voice until he came back from his first semester in college. Meanwhile, I was um, growing up uh, shy and in his shadow a little bit that way. Um, when he left, I picked up a guitar and started to learn how to play bass by plunking along to uh, Beatles records. And by and by, Orleans started up as a trio while I was still in my... Um, last year of high school and then that fall they expanded they wanted to expand so i got the audition and i didn't fail it's, i'm sure uh nepotism didn't hurt so that quartet um launched into our first album just about six months after that and as you say the rest is history 50 years of it what do you want to know yeah so so take us back now what got you inspired uh playing bass um, I was a, really a Beatles, big Beatles fan, uh, probably more than any other thing, and a McCartney fan. So when I found that guitar in the closet that Larry left and had no clue, I just started plunking away on the low E string. That's all I knew, the one string. And then I eventually figured out, you know, how they related to each other. And I <clears throat> just gravitated to bass. Um, of course, other influences were... Uh, big influences like James Jamerson at Motown. Um, yeah, probably Jamerson and, and McCartney, and every those are the two foundational players I followed. But a lot of great players, and still are great players. I'm an okay player. Um, I don't aspire to be flashy or you know the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer. But I, I pull my weight. Now, and Lance, do you think, it, it, is it easier to play the bass than the guitar? Well, you only have to probably do one note at a time. <laughs> there's, a, there's an advantage there. But uh, later in years, I, I became a guitar player of sorts. I don't consider my, you know, not the thing I would be hired for. But I can I can do that. It's a different, uh, it's a different animal. Like keyboards is a different animal. But they all relate to each other. Um Stylistically, yeah, I think you approach each instrument in a different way. And um, I just happened to be a bass player, which worked well because um, that's what Orleans needed at the time. Yeah, and, and you know, losing uh, tragically your brother, Larry Hoppin, whose powerful voice was really the center of several of the band's biggest hits. I mean, that must have been a big, that must have came as a big shocking blow to the band. Well, yeah, it was a catac cataclysmic kind of event. But to go back, based on what you said, yeah, his voice, he was the radio voice of the band. And John Hall and his ex-wife, Johanna, they were the main songwriters. And there was a lot of um, 
you know, everybody wanted space inside the container of Orleans, particularly John and Johanna wrote a lot of songs. Larry wrote songs. Wells Kelly wrote songs. Everybody wanted to get their stuff on the records. There's only so much room. And and John was, uh, you know, the de facto leader. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of tension there, but good type of tension. In the end, what happened was John had written a few songs that, uh, well, he, he liked to sing all the songs he wrote. Who doesn't? But he wrote a few songs that he couldn't sing well. Uh, they were out of his range. They happened to be Dance With Me and Still The One were among those two. So Larry defaulted to the lead singer. And um, lo and behold, those became the hits. So the magic formula turned out to be John's writing and uh, Larry singing. So, and uh, yeah, Larry had an extraordinary voice. That's for sure. When he passed in 2012, it was it was tragic. I don't think it's a secret anymore that he took his own life. So my older brother and my comrade, my my you know, comrade in arms for 40 years, um, we worked together, was suddenly gone, and that that drew everything into chaos, as you might imagine. So in the midst of that. I had to very quickly decide what to do, and um, we figured we'd finish the year. Like, we had about eight more shows to do, and I turned the question from can we do that into how can we do that, and enlisted the help of um, several of the band's alumni, because we've had many versions and uh, people coming through. And as it turned out, John, who had been in Congress, he uh, had two two terms in Congress just prior to that. He was itching to get back in the band anyway, and then suddenly there was space. So John came back. We finished the year. I figured that was it. That's 40 years. 40 years seems to be enough, and um, the wind's out of the sails. So uh, that's not what happened, though. At, just as we were done, I got a call from a man who would become our next manager who said he could make it happen if we wanted to do it. And that turned into the 2013, what they call the sail rock tour where we were the house band for six or seven other acts, including Christopher cross, who was the uh, headliner. So that year turned into the next, the next, the next Here we are 10 years later, not 40 years, but 50 years. And um, having survived Larry's passing, adapting, the band to it uh, as we have adapted over the over all 50 years and we're still we're still playing so until people don't want to hear this music anymore we'll keep doing that and i tell you you know i did some research and i you know one last point on your brother i found a good point your brother made back in 1994 when when he mentioned in an article that you know about the the band's passion of play. If ten people were there, we'll have a good time and do the show as you know, if it, as if it was a big crowd. We have a good time playing. Period. And we get on stage. We think about that gig and not the next one. Is that what you bring about? Do you think that way when you're performing? Uh, yeah, that sounds like him and sounds like us. Um... I think we have a rule if the audience is smaller than the band, we don't want to play. <laughs> but other than that, uh, we're, we're good to go. And um, I think that's a healthy attitude, you know, like uh, people want to people want to have a good time. We want to have a good time. And every when the band had a good time, when we were all pulling towards the center and enjoying it, then we would continue. And there were times in our careers where, you know, it just wasn't any fun anymore. And those are the times we said, okay, enough is enough. So the band had, it was, it kind of cycled. We would uh, break up and then find a reason to come back together and do it until it wasn't any fun. And then we would put it away and then we would come back and so on and so forth. So it's amazing that we made it to year 50. No, nobody would have predicted that. Uh, the first breakup was after five years. So for, for whatever reasons, um, mostly we're still having fun. That's ironic, isn't it? That's why we. Uh, that's how we've persisted all these years.
Yeah. Now, now I don't know how true this is, Lance. Um, Orleans, did it find its core audience touring the clubs and college circuit in the Northeast those early days? Yeah, we carved out a niche. Um, you know, we're we're all New York. We were all New Yorkers, right? I, uh, Hoppins grew up on Long Island. Wells was from Ithaca. John was from Elmira region. The band congregated in the town of Woodstock, New York. That's where John had bought a house. And um, we played, we did what you can't do anymore. We would play this club circuit up and down the throughway, basically. Play two, three, four nights at a club and go home and then do it again next week. Rochester, Ithaca, Syracuse, Poughkeepsie, Utica, so on and so forth. And um, also up and down the East Coast, college gigs, this is how we cut our teeth, and that's when Rolling Stone magazine was kind enough to call us the um, best unrecorded band in history. Of course, once you start recording, then the critics come out. Um, but it was nice while it lasted. Uh, so that's how we developed our style um, those early years, and then and cut a couple albums which were under the radar cult favorites in the, in the region and um, it wasn't until Chuck Plotkin, the head of A&R VP at Asylum, heard the band that we got the polish, the polish on it and he took uh, Dance With Me which had a previous recording actually that did nothing. He took that song and made it a hit record and the irony is Dance With Me was very atypical of every, every other thing we did. We were basically a funky R&B rock band and uh, that was not that so it put us in a different light and set us in a little different direction but in retrospect it all works you know dance with me is not that different from still the one is not that different from the rest of the material although it, it does have a kind of a wide berth of styles we always everything from reggae to rb to folk to to rock and roll so for better or worse, Orleans has always been an eclectic kind of band. No question. We're talking with Lance Hoppin, legendary bassist of <clears throat> Orleans, who's with us this morning. Apologize. Uh, so, Lance, you mentioned Dance With Me, uh, Orleans' first top 40 single, reaching Billboard Top 100. Um, <clears throat> what was your thought initially when you first heard that tune? The, yeah. <laughs> We uh, we were rehearsing at that time. This is 1973, uh, three, I guess. And we, we rehearsed in a little garage on the property I was renting with our roadie. And we had um, mattresses on the walls, mattresses on the, on the uh, concrete block walls in this tiny space so we could rehearse. And John came in one day with this guitar figure, the Dance With Me thing, and that's all he had. And Larry said, well, that's, that sounds really good. You should probably finish that one. Um, so he pre John presented it to Johanna, his, his wife and writing partner at the time. And she said, dance with me. And he said, that's kind of too simple. Can you think of something else? And she, she said, no. So she wrote that lyric. And then the rest is history. That's how that came about. And then still the one, 1976, I, if you recall, wasn't that song used as a jingle for ABC TV? Right. So there again, you know, John, uh, well, Johanna had written that lyric on, a, on an envelope, they say. Friend had asked her, everyone's writing breakup songs, can't somebody write a stay together song? So she, she wrote that, handed it to John. He said that in about 15 minutes. He had all the uh, all the changes, and the song was done. Um, so we, when we cut it, I don't think anybody had knew what it would become. Maybe maybe Chuck, our producer, had an idea, but probably nobody could have predicted its ubiquitousness. So um, that was um, that peaked in like, summer, fall '76. We were on tour with Jackson Brown. It was kind of our peak our heyday into 77 and then the tensions i mentioned became too much and john decided to leave he left in the fall of 77 
And at the same time, and maybe this helped facilitate that for him to make that decision, ABC TV picked up that, still the one, for their um, network theme song, not only in America, but in uh, Australia as well. And that ran, uh, anybody our age can remember, that ran for two years, 77, 78, as their network theme song. So uh, that put it into the public spotlight, but it's also one of the most licensed songs of all time for commercials of all kinds for political campaigns for tvs and movies and such and uh it still gets uses all the time so you think that's the the band's main stream song still the one over dance with me yeah i i think in terms of uh um yeah i think that's probably the number one career signature song with Dance with me a close second. I think in any given month, if you look at streaming numbers and such, it could be either one. Um, so there's a love for that. And to a lesser degree, Love Takes Time in 79 uh, was a hit one. number 11, I think, on Billboard. And people love that song as well. But it's those three hits, particularly Still the One Dance With Me, um, that's what's enabled us to be able to work all this time. Um, that awareness of the public, not necessarily the, the fan who's deep into it and, you know, knows all 17 albums worth of material. So, um, and a lot of people still, you know, they know those songs, but they don't equate it with the name of the band because that kind of marketing effort and connection never really happened for us. So, um, you could play Dance With Me and say, ask the, you know, 10 people who did it, and they might give you 10 different answers. But uh, whatever, whatever gets the uh, the gigs to come our way, that's a good thing. All right, so um, now you moved to Nashville in 89. Was that the year? Yeah, so like I said, the band came and went, and in uh, one of the times we put it away was the end of 87. 88 was a really not good year for me. It was a year of divorce and all kinds of stuff. So um, I was not at the top of my game. And I got a fortuitous phone call from an old friend that offered me a a gig in their uh, very happening at the time uh, country act. And that brought me to Nashville with work for work. And um, that that was the early 89. So that's where I've been ever since. And I love it here. I had another marriage and ex-marriage and raised two kids and have three grandkids. And it all kind of happened because of that fortuitous phone call that one, that one day. And that's a, that's a kind of a really good long story, but I don't have time for that here. How that uh, almost like the divine intervention that uh, placed all this in front of me. And then, you know, before I let you go, I mean, we have like five minutes left. Um, I want to also mention Conjuring, which was released in 2017, yeah, which showed really your first solo side of Lance Hoppin. Um, at the risk of, con- of correcting you, it's Conjuring. Con- conjuring. To, to conjure is to create from nothing something uh-huh. um, to bring into existence. And mm-hmm. it, there's a song that has that lyric in it, that word. But I had, uh, in that year, 2016, I think it was, it was released, released early 17, I had uh, time on my hands. I had enough money for a change. I had a, a, a collection of songs that had never been recorded or had never been done the way I would have done them. And so I collected this material, 15 tracks, and... Um, endeavored to make a solo project. So I didn't do it because I thought it would sell a million copies. I did it to document these songs so they would not just disappear. And uh, I'm very proud of that particular, uh, that work. And I think it stands up, but yeah, that's my, uh, that's my version of me as opposed to me in the team. Very nice, Lance. And, you know, I have a large listening audience. I mean, do you have a website where the audience can log on and maybe purchase that release you did in 2017? Yeah. You know, the irony, uh, this is a weird story, but we have lost control of our domain, Uh Orleans Online, OrleansOnline.com. So it it is no longer. And 
at the same time, we've been completely renovating and building a new website. So at the moment, no, we don't have a website, not quite yet. But there's a thing called Bandcamp, um, which is a is a place to have a store. And Orleans has a store on Bandcamp.com, and that's where you could buy anything you want, including Conjuring. Um, and our Facebook page is Orleans Music, and that's where you can get updates on you know, where we're going to play and, and interact there. Yeah, I'm looking on Orleans on Facebook, and I do see you're heading down, uh, we're actually going to the southeast, to playing in South Carolina, Florida. You have a couple of shows coming up in July. Yeah, we got four gig, four gigs in July. It's, you know, it's sparse out there. It's still post-pandemic. It's kind of a crazy world with travel. I mean, 6,000 flights were canceled over the weekend. It's not easy. So we have a light schedule, and that's fine with me. Uh, it's kind of like semi-retirement, but not yet. I want to go, want to go in a few more years anyway. But yeah, the schedule, the schedule is on uh, Facebook, and as we get new gigs, and they do come in all the time, uh, we'll be posting there. And I see August twenty seventh. You're on the West Coast, Plymouth, California. That's you know, this is where the station is in California. Right. That's in. Uh, uh, Plymouth is North California, and that gig is a holdover, I think, from 2020. It just kept get moving further into the future as COVID uh, would not let up. So finally, we'll get to play out there. Um, and also, I think, uh, so we're backing Peter Beckett for a few songs from Player. And I think uh, Walter Egan is on that show as well. So, or somebody. Um they, they blur together. But yes, yeah, August 27th, and then some shows in the fall. Yeah, and Walter Egan was on this program. We also had one of the uh, Orleans past members on this program a few weeks ago, Jerry Morata. Oh. Uh, yeah, he was on the program. And I want to ask you, while we're on this topic, like every band, Orleans had so many past members. Um, how, when a new member joined the band, how was the camaraderie? Was there any one band member that Orleans did not get along with? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say, though, that um, that early quintet, quartet, the quartet adding Jerry, there was a lot of um, bulls in a china shop, let's put it that way. Not Nothing overt, just like a lot of uh, young men striving. Later on, not so much, you know, more maturity. And uh, so today, I, ha I have the distinction of being the last man standing. John Hall retired from the road in March just because it's, it's tough. It's tough. The traveling is really tough. So the band is myself, my younger brother Lane, who's been with me for 25 years. Fly Amaro on guitar has been with me over 20. And then the newer guys, uh, Brady Spencer here in Nashville, been playing drums since 2018, and our brand new guy, last fall, Tom Lane. So the deal with me is I will not present Orleans unless it's up to snuff. Uh, I'm not going to do a, a bad job or tarnish its legacy. So I believe in this band as much as I've believed in every other uh, incarnation along the way. And there have been several. So, so like the uh, hiring process, they would have to audition for you live and you make the decisions yeah, when when uh, when well, Fly had Fly had to come off the road last August for a health reason. We scrambled to find a replacement, and you know, searched far and wide and found here in Nashville, Tom Lane, and he's a great singer. He's a really good player, and we got along. I mean, all those things have to happen. Tom's very um, demure and grateful to be in the band. You know, so. That works. And then, uh, ironically, when John was ready to get off the road, Fly was healthy again. So he came back, and that really, that really helps things, because I do not want to look for any new more band members ever. I mean, my, uh, final question. I'm, um, anyone, any one artist that you or the band would love to collaborate with? Oh, man. Uh, collaborate with, well, like in writing songs and playing with Writing, and such. Again, touring, you know, I mean, writing songs, being on stage with. 
Every, I mean, yeah, many, uh, starting from McCartney on down, who wouldn't want to write with or be on stage with some of these legends. Um, one of our aspirations, though, that's more uh, perhaps attainable, I would love to play the Ryman here in Nashville. And uh, that would probably take us plus a couple other acts to fill the room. But that's on my bucket list. That's an incredibly dense historical venue right here in my hometown. And that would be something I'd really like to do. Well, Lance, listen, I really appreciate a few minutes of your time. I, you know, I can't thank you enough. Brian, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Really an honor. Uh, Lance Hoppin from Orleans. Until next week, happy collecting to all.